Hello everyone and welcome to the Cardiology USMLE MCCQE1 course. If you are a medical student or an international medical graduate, whether in Canada or in the US, this course will help you. But first, let me tell you a bit about myself. Okay. My name is Rupen Odebashian. I'm an internal medicine resident currently and a hematology and oncology fellow in the future, going to start next year. And you can find me on social media, on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. I love education. I love teaching. And I've been teaching on YouTube and other platforms for the last several years. My education has been unique. I came to Canada five years ago and I wanted to go to the US initially, but for some circumstances I couldn't. So I ended up writing all the Canadian licensing exams and all the United States licensing exams. And as you can see, I achieved high scores in all the exams. And then after writing the exams, I was able to match into my first choice in internal medicine residency in Canada. And Canada is a very competitive place to match. But I was able to do it from the first time. And next year, I'm going to continue my dream in the US to do hematology and oncology fellowship. And over the years, after writing all these exams, I gained many important skills. And that's what I want to do in this course. I want to share the skills that will help you write MCQ exams. Okay, let me tell you a bit about how to write an MCQ test. To solve an MCQ question, you need two things. One, you need the knowledge. So, and then you need the skill to use this knowledge to write the best, to choose the best answer possible among the different options given to you. For example, if I ask you, what are the diagnostic tasks for high failure? You might mention trans thoracic echo, cardiac catheterization, stress test. And if I ask you, what are the treatments for heart failure? You might say ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, but in the MCQ setting, they will give you different options, treatment and diagnostic tests, and they will ask you to choose between them. They might give you a patient who's presenting with acute heart failure and ask you what is the best next step, to do an echo or to give them a Lasix IV. And of course, it's Lasix IV. So you acquire this skill by doing lots of multiple choice questions. Over the years, I wrote and I solved more than 20,000 multiple choice questions. I finished all North American exams. And my goal in this course is to close the gap between the knowledge and the skills that you have to acquire to solve an MCQ question. I will give you knowledge and I will take you step by step on how to use the different bits of information in each MCQ question to choose the right answer. But please remember that this course is supplementary for your education. You still need to get a question bank and you have to do lots of questions. I remember when I wrote my USMLE step one, I did around like eight to 10,000 questions. I solved all the MMEs. I did the UR question bank. I did part of the Kaplan question bank until even when I wrote the American Board of Internal Medicine, I did the UR question bank. I did the medical knowledge self-assessment program question bank. So I've done lots of questions and the only way to an ACE and MCQ exam is to do lots of questions. But at the same time, I will give you the appropriate knowledge to build the base together. It is your job to take this knowledge and translate it to skills. I will help you in that process, but you still have to do MCQs. That being said, in this course, I will also explain the keywords. What are the important things to look for in each presentation and each question. Okay, so let's start. Welcome to cardiology. You have a 73 year old patient presented to the office with worsening shortness of breath. He reports worsening shortness of breath over the last four weeks. Initially, he was able to walk several blocks. However, currently he only can walk two blocks. The patient's past medical history is significant for diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension. His medications are perindopril, atorvastatin, hydrochlorothiazide, insulin, metformin, and cetagliptin. On review of his systems, the patient also reports increased weight gain over the last two months. On physical exam, the patient looked tired. 
his heart rate 78 the blood pressure is 160 over 80 oxygen saturation is 95 percent on room air and respiratory rate is 18 long exam reveals bilateral crackles cardiovascular exam shows s1 s2 within normal limits with no murmurs rubs or gallops there is a bilateral plus repeating edema on the lower extremities which one of the following is the most likely pathophysiology increased sodium reabsorption at the renal tubule obstruction at the left ventricular outflow tract hypercoagulable disorder a typical organism affecting the lung interstitial space pause the video and choose an answer and then we can move on and the right answer is a neurohormonal systems including the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the sympathetic nervous system are activated in response to reduced ejection fraction angiotensin 2 and aldosterone are produced when the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is activated okay let's go and look at the anatomy of the question so a 73 year old patient so first the age is appropriate for a heart failure usually more than age of 60 to 70 patients with heart failure usually the reason of their heart failure is coronary artery disease the patient presents the office with worsening shortness of breath whenever i'm facing shortness of breath i usually ask myself two things is it acute or chronic and I think about three differential diagnoses, lungs, heart, and the blood. Okay. Increased shortness of breath. He reports worsening shortness of breath over the last four weeks. So this is more in keeping with subacute to chronic shortness of breath. Initially, he was able to walk several blocks. However, currently, he can walk only two blocks. So the patient is deteriorating, and there is an effect on his activity level. Okay. The patient's spasmodic history is significant for, so in any MCQ, they will give you a presentation, okay, the main concern that the patient is coming with, and then they will give you different data, and this data, you're going to use it to choose the best answer. Okay, so the patient's spasmodic history is significant for diabetes, dyslipidia, and hypertension. This Past medical history is very common. You're going to see it on MCQs, whether you're writing the U.S. or Canadian licensing exams. And whenever you have a combination of dyslipidia, diabetes, hypertension, you have to think about metabolic syndrome. And this patient is most likely have metabolic syndrome. His medications are perindopril, atorvastatin, hydrochlorothiazide, insulin, metformin, and cetagliptin. Whenever you are solving a question that it is related to heart failure, it's always important to put, to put to pay attention what medications the patient is on because you might need to optimize the patient's medications. On review of so far, I have no clue what is the cause or what is the underlying pathophysiology. So this is a two-step question. First, I need to identify the diagnosis, and then I need to identify the treatment. And in real exam setting, I always start by reading the question first. When you read the question first, this will help you to look at which data you want to use and which data you can pass when you are reading the question quickly. So when they are saying the pathophysiology, so first I need to make a diagnosis and then I need to choose an answer. So it's a two-step question and my goal from reading the question is to know what is the diagnosis. So I have a patient who is presenting with subacute to chronic shortness of breath. On review of the system, the patient also reports weight gain over the last two months. So when I have shortness of breath with increasing weight gain, so that will make me think about fluid overload. And the fluid overload happen in heart failure and the chronic kidney disease. On physical exam, the patient looked tired. His heart rate is 78. His blood pressure is 160 over 80. So the patient's vital signs are very important here because the patient, as we see here, is a bit hypertensive. Oxygen saturation, 95%. And this is also important when you look at questions regarding heart failure because, or questions of shortness of breath because this is what might change your management. If the patient is acutely hypoxic, you're going to go to treatment versus diagnosis. You're going to choose treatment first because you need to protect the airways and you need to deliver oxygen first. Okay, let's continue. Respiratory rate is 18, so it's tachypnic. Lung exam reveals bilateral crackles. So now I'm getting something. So I have weight gain. I have bilateral crackles, I have shortness of breath, so it's either a heart failure or kidney disease leading to accumulation of fluids. Cardiovascular exam shows S1, S2 within normal limits, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. There is a bilateral plus 3 pitting edema on the lower extremities. So we have a fluid overload situation here. Okay, looking at this patient and his 
past medical history, the diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, this is more in keeping with heart failure. Again, this could be a chronic kidney disease, but usually acute on chronic kidney disease leads to similar presentation or very, very end stage chronic kidney disease leads to this presentation. However, it's most likely to be heart failure in this case because of the data presented and because of the questions being asked. Increase sodium reabsorption in the renal tubule. And the right answer is this one. We're going to talk more about it. Obstruction at the left ventricular outflow tract. This example is about hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, which we're going to talk about in this course. Hypercoagulable disorder. Usually, this is an underlying pathophysiology that can lead to pulmonary embolism and it can lead to heart failure. And this picture is not in keeping with pulmonary embolism. Usually pulmonary embolism presents acutely with shortness of breath over one or two days. A typical organism affecting the lung interstitial space is less likely because this option talk about an infectious cause. And here they did not mention any high temperature or a fever or a cough. So I need cough and shortness of breath to think about infect uh, infectious organism. And here I don't have that. I have pure exertional shortness of breath. And I don't have lots of data. So I'm most likely thing I'm thinking about is here is the heart failure. And we're going to explain why a option A is the right answer here in details. So let's talk about the pathophysiology of heart failure. When the heart is not ejecting enough of blood to the kidneys, your kidneys are suffocating. I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, right? What they do is they activate the renin. So the kidney, uh, the macula densa in the kidney releases renin and renin activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So this renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the sympathetic system together will lead to several changes that will make sure the kidneys are well perfused. So this is a way of the kidney saying, hey man, I can't tolerate this. I need my blood. Where is my blood? So angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction. And when there is a vasoconstriction, there will be an increased blood pressure. And also it stimulates the thirst. So the goal here is to give kidneys its own blood. Aldosterone, on the other hand, it's lead, it leads to fluid retention by increasing sodium reabsorption. And that's the mechanism that the question was talking about. Aldosterone, okay, increase sodium reabsorption. And when there is a sodium reabsorption, usually water also uh, passes with sodium to uh, the, the renal interstitium, and then it, re it re gets reabsorbed to the blood. So there will be less release or secretion or excretion of water so the water will not be excreted in the urine and there will be fluid accumulation and that's to help the kidneys maintain its own perfusion sympathetic nervous system also gets activated there will be release of epinephrine and norepinephrine and there will be also an increase in the heart rate and contractility the kidneys are getting suffocated and not only they will constrict the blood vessels, not only they will increase the volume of the blood, they will make the heart go fast. Yeah, baby. So they will make the heart contract, 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 and contract, contract, contract. And that's what the sympathetic nervous system does. So we have two hormones. Sorry, we have two things happen. One is activation of the sympathetic nervous system can make the heart contract. Two is activation of renin and jutensin aldosterone that can lead to vasoconstriction and the fluid retention. And also the sympathetic nervous system releases vasopressin. Vasopressin is the anti-diuretic hormone. What does it do? It is anti-diuretic. It means it will not let you diurese. In simple English, it will not make you lose water. So it will prevent you from losing water. So the sympathetic system not only works on the heart, also releases the hormone that increase water reabsorption. As you can see, we have several hormones here. We have the aldosterone, we have the vasopre vasopressin, and the sympathetic nervous system by itself is working on the heart, increasing the contractility, and all this to maintain the kidney perfusion. Which of the following is the most common cause of this condition? Hypertension, coronary artery disease, diabetes, uh, diabetes or dyslipidemia? Okay. So I quickly know that I'm facing a question from the cardiovascular uh, section. Okay, let's read it. 
Okay, 73 year old patient presented to the office with worsening shortness of breath. Again, shortness of breath, I think about heart, kidneys, lungs, blood. He reports worsening shortness of breath over the last four weeks. It's a chronic, not acute. Initially, he was able to walk several blocks. However, he currently, he can only walk two blocks. So it's exertional shortness of breath. He also reports waking up at night several times and feeling better upon sitting. The patient's vast medical history is limited for dyslipidemia, diabetes, hypertension. His medications are perindopril, atorvastatin, hydrochlorothiazide, insulin, metformin, and sitagliptin. On review of systems, the patient also reports increased weight gain over the last two months. On physical exam, the patient looked tired. His heart rate is 78. His blood pressure is 160 over 80. Oxygen saturation is 95% on room air. And the respiratory rate is 18. Long exam reveals bilateral crackles. Cardiovascular exam reveals an extra heart sound during early diastole with no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. There is a bilateral plus 3 pitting edema on the lower extremities. Echo shows normal biatrial size and function, increased pulmonary artery pressure, and ejection fraction 65%. Which one of the following is the most common cause of this condition? Hypertension, coronary artery disease, dyslipidemia, or diabetes. Okay. Pause the video, think about it, choose the answer. Okay, three, two, one. And the right answer is, drums please. Hypertension. Hypertension is the most common cause of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Let's go back to the question and see what are the key important findings. So we have a 73 year old patient. So first, I always start from here. Which one of the following is the most common cause of this condition? Hypertension, coronary artery disease, dyslipidemia, or diabetes. 73-year-old patient present to the office with worsening shortness of breath. He reports worsening shortness of breath over the last four weeks. So it's chronic shortness of breath. Shortness of breath, I think about lung, kidneys, blood, heart. It's four weeks. It's acute. Sorry, it's, it's subacute to chronic. Initially was able to walk several blocks. However, currently can only walk two blocks. So it's exertional shortness of breath. He also reports waking up several nights, several, uh, several times at night, gasping for air and feeling better upon sitting. So they are telling you that this guy has orthopnea. So exertional shortness of breath, orthopnea, that's a sign of fluid overload. Again, this can happen in heart failure, but can sometimes also happen in chronic kidney disease and fluid accumulation. But in an MCQ setting, this is more likely a heart failure question. The patient's past medical history is even for diabetes, this epidemia, and hypertension. So now we have vascular risk factors. So I'm trending toward, I'm leaning toward hyper, heart failure more. His medications are perindopril, atorvastatin, hydrochlorothiazide, and sulfonylamine, metformin, and sitagliptin. So this guy is not, he doesn't only have diabetes. Like diabetes have several lines of treatment. Uh, lifestyle modification, the metformin, the metformin, and um, dapagliflozin, the metformin and citagliptin. So this guy is on metformin, he's on citagliptin, he's on insulin. So he does have advanced diabetes and that puts him very high risk for developing coronary and peripheral artery disease. He also is an autorvastatin for his lipid control. So the guy, the guy is vasculopath. On review of systems, the patient also reports increased weight gain over the last two months. On physical exam, the patient looked tired. His heart rate is 78, the blood pressure is 160 over 80. The guy is hypertensive. Oxygen saturation is 95% on room air. He's really hypoxic too. You examine his lungs, there are bilateral crackles. So bilateral crackles, orthopnea, that's a sign of fluid overload. And this happens when your left heart or left ventricle cannot contract properly and there will be fuel accumulation in your lungs. Cardiovascular exam reveals an extra heart sound during early diastole. So this is a sign of S3. So S3 is an early heart sound during early diastole. They will not tell you S3. They will tell you early heart, extra heart sound early diastole. With no murmurs, rubs, or gallops, there is a plus 3 pitting edema. So we have several signs telling me that this guy have a fluid overload. One, ex, uh, orthopnea. Two, we have the S3. Three, we have the plus three peating edema, okay? And also lung exam shows bilateral crackles. Echo shows normal biatrial size and function, increased pulmonary artery pressure, and ejection fraction 65%. So until, uh, until the word echo, I was thinking that this guy have heart failure, but now they are telling me ejection fraction is 
normal and this is called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in the next slides we're going to talk about heart failure the diagnosis and the treatments and the common causes but whenever the diagnosis of heart failure is a clinical as you can see i made the diagnosis of heart failure before reaching the word ejection fraction and echo I made the diagnosis of heart failure based on the findings, exertion and shortness of breath, based on the finding of plus 3 edema, based on the finding of um, a fluid overload, lung crackles, or topnia. And then when I read the ejection fraction, this helped me to categorize, is it heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or is it heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? And that's what it means that heart failure diagnosis is clinical. Which one of the following is the most common cause of this condition? And the right answer is hypertension. Okay, in the next slides, we're going to talk about um, the causes of heart failure and the definition of heart failure, the types of heart failure, the important signs and symptoms that I need to look for when I'm solving an MCQ question. So now let's talk about the definition of heart failure. So heart failure is a clinical syndrome that mean you don't need an echo to make the diagnosis you don't need an x-ray to make the diagnosis you make the diagnosis based mainly on the clinical findings because you might have signs and symptoms of a fluid overload and decreased cardiac output and the echo might show you normal ejection fraction so heart failure it's a clinical syndrome that is characterized by signs and symptoms of fluid overload and decreased cardiac output, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. And it can result from any structural or functional impairments in the contractility or the diastole, the diastolic function of the heart. So it's either problem in contraction or problem in relaxation. If you work too much, you have a problem. If you can't relax, you have a problem. If you work too much, you have a problem. If you can't relax, you have a problem. So you contract too much. If you don't contract too much, you have a problem. If you can't relax, you have a problem. It's heart failure. Okay? So when the most common cause of heart failure, it depends on the type. So heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, when your heart is tired, your heart can't pump, your heart can't contract. So this is a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. R stands for reduced ejection fraction. So the most common cause is coronary artery disease. And the other hand, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction when there is a uh, the most common cause is hypertension there are signs and symptoms of heart failure but the the patient the the, the the ejection fraction is normal so ejection of the blood is okay so sorry ejection of the blood is decreased so this is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is there is a problem in the ventricular feeling and or relaxation so this is a problem with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction so you can't eject the blood it's a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. You can't relax. You can't take more blood. You can't take more love. So this is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Okay. So let's focus on the signs and the symptoms because they are very important and they are the question keys. So when it comes to the signs and the symptoms, we have two categories and side of, of signs and symptoms can happen. One, fluid overload or volume overload. When your heart is not contracting, it's not pumping enough of blood. So the blood will accumulate and the blood will go to your lungs, right? So when you have a blood in your lungs, so that will create a transudate in the lungs. And this will create pulmonary edema. So that's why patients with heart failure can't fly a flat because this will make more blood backing up to their lungs. And this will create orthopnea. Also, when you can't breathe, you can't do an exertion. So you have exertional shortness of breath. And then you have a fluid overload. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to gain weight. It's very simple. Drink a couple of liters of fluids and go stand on the scale. The next thing you're going to see, you gained four pounds. Voila. That's easy. That's simple. And finally, the paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. The paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea happens when patients lie flat and they have volume overload. But that volume is not enough to cause orthopnea, but it builds overnight, it builds, it builds, it builds, it builds, and suddenly transforms to pulmonary edema and the extra fluids, and it can lead to paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. So the patient will wake up in the middle of the night gasping for air. The second couple, uh, the second group of symptoms is symptoms related to low cardiac output. Lots of patients with 
heart failure, they will have hypotension. Okay, let's stop there. There is another chronic problem that patients also have hypotension, and it is cirrhosis. Lots of patients with cirrhosis are also hypotensive. It's something to keep in mind. So let's go back to heart failure. Lots of patients with heart failure, they also have low pulse pressure because their systolic pulse pressure is usually low. When their heart is tired, heart can contract, heart is feeling weak. Okay, so this will decrease the systolic blood pressure when you can't eject the blood. So this will create cool extremities. And this is very important. When I see in the hospital a patient with heart failure, I always examine their extremities. After you match and you become a resident, you are on the medicine ward, make sure every patient with heart failure to examine their extremities because it could be cold extremities and this is a bad sign of heart failure and it could be a sign of cardiogenic shock. Okay, and finally, reduce cognition. It is something common in patients with heart failure when you can't pump a blood to your brain. Guess what's going to happen? You're not going to be able to think. So this is also very important. Okay, so we talked about the signs and symptoms of heart failure. We talked about definition about heart failure. Let's go and do another question. Okay, let's do this question. 72-year-old man evaluated for 12 weeks of exertional exercise breath. Stop right there. Stop right there and please read the question. Which one of the following tests is most likely to be affected by the patient's characteristics? Chest X-ray, TSH, antiprobe MP, ECG. Okay, so first I have to know what is the diagnosis. Then I have to pick about the patient's characteristics and know which one of these will be affected by that. Okay, so it's a two or three step question. Now let's go and read the question. 72 year old man is evaluated for 12 weeks history of exertional shortness of breath. Exertional shortness of breath. It could be lung, it could be heart, it could be the blood. His past medical history is significant for hypertension and fibrillation. His medications are apixaban, perindopril, chlortalidone. Apixaban for AFib, perindopril, and chlortalidone for hypertension. That makes sense. He also reports an increase in his waist circumference. Hmm. Exertional shortness of breath, increase in waist circumference. I'm thinking about fluid overload. On physical exam, the blood pressure is 178 over 90. His vital signs, other vital signs are stable. The BMI is 37. The central venous pressure is 10 centimeter. Wow, 10 centimeter above a sternal angle. So we have elevated JVP, increase in weight circumference, increase in weight circumference, elevated JVP. We have fluid overload with exertion shortness of breath. We're talking about heart failure. Now exam shows bilateral crackles done. We have fluid overload. We have crackles. We have increased weight circumference. We have elevated JVP. Also, this guy has an S4. Hmm. So that means we have a stiff left ventricle. An ECG demonstrated sinus rhythm and left ventricular hypertrophy. That makes sense. If you have S4, you have left ventricular hypertrophy, and you have hypertension. Okay. So we have hypertension. Probably it's chronic. We have S4. We have left ventricular hypertrophy. You do an echo shows ejection fraction 65%. What is this baby? This is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We have fluid overload. We have exertional shortness of breath, but normal ejection fraction, but normal ejection fraction. Increase the ventricular wall thickness. Okay, that keeps keeping with the ECG. Chest X-ray shows bilateral interstitial infiltrate. Which one of the following tests is most likely to be affected by the patient's characteristics? Chest X-ray, TSH, antipro, PMP, or ECG. Choose the answer. Stop the video and think about it. And the correct answer is, thumbs please. So the correct answer is BMP. BMP levels are typically lower in patients with high BMI. Okay, let's quickly highlight the important things that I need in this question. So this is a two or three step question. First, I need to know the diagnosis. Then I need to know which one of those diagnostic tests is affected by the patient's weight. And so a 12 weeks exertion shortness of breath. This is a chronic exertion shortness of breath. The bulk pressure is elevated. BMI is 37 center. The central venous pressure is 10. So we have signs of fluid overload which is abdominal distension, increased waist circumference, elevated jugular venous pressure, okay? We have um, signs uh, also of heart failure of exertion shortness of breath. The other things that we need to look at is why this patient is having heart failure. So probably it's a chronic long-lasting hypertension that leads to stiff ventricle and prob uh, inability to dilate. So this patient have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction because your ejection fraction is normal. 
okay and also bilateral insertion infiltrate is a sign of fluid overload and anti pro bmp could be low in patients with high bmi okay we're going to talk about it in further details in the next video all righty let's talk about heart failure diagnosis so i'm going to talk about all the diagnostic tests and then we're going to do other questions to talk about which diagnostic test to choose from so if you're doing the mcc qe1 exam the last part of the exam is the cdm the clinical decision making if you are doing the usmle step 3 exam the second day the half day uh, the, the, the the last part of the second day it is also clinical decision making so this slide will help you when it, whenever it comes to the heart failure diagnosis okay so we need some blood work we need some imaging okay so complete blood count okay so the first thing you want to make sure the patient is not anemic when you order a complete blood count okay because first anemia it is something common in patients with heart failure second anemia can lead to worsening shortness of breath and make heart failure worse and it's important to rule it out and to investigate the underlying cause right so you need cbc you need serum electrolytes okay you need kidney function tests you need bmp glucose and lipid levels and this is also important when you are working in a hospital setting or an outpatient setting you have a patient with a new diagnosis of heart failure you need to diagnose and look for secondary risk factors right like the glucose and the lipid levels you need to order liver chemistry test because you might start them on a statin and this can affect the liver chemistry test and you need to order also thyroid hormone thyroid hormone is very important to evaluate if there is an occult hypopyroidism or hyperthyroidism those are reversible causes of heart failure okay when else tsh is also important workup for a chronic condition in patients with dementia in patients with dementia patients with dementia you have to rub hypothyroidism because hypothyroidism can lead to secondary dementia okay and finally imaging you have to order echo there are other imaging modalities we're going to which are we are going to talk about but let's focus a bit on the bmp so whenever I have a patient with shortness of breath, I'm not sure if it's the heart or not the heart, the heart or not the heart, the heart or not the heart, to be or not to be, we order BMP. So the BMP come in two flavors, uh, the BMP or anti-pro BMP, depends on what center you are working at, um, and also uh, the exam format. Um, usually patients who have uh, heart failure, uh, they have elevated BMP levels, uh, elevated uh, BMP levels are high when they are more than 400 picogram per milliliter and they are low when they are less than 100 picogram per millimeters and patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction they tend to have lower BMP and remember our patient in the last question had a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction so that's a risk factor and also patients with obesity also obesity bmp levels are reduced in patients with uh, elevated bmi so heart failure preserved ejection fraction uh, have lower bmp and patients with high bmi have lower bmp but that being said uh, there are other factors that can increase bmp like if you have chronic kidney disease uh, if you have sepsis uh, if you have uh, if you are old if the patient is an um, an angiotensin receptor neprilacin inhibitor uh, arni or females also tend to have higher BMP okay so there are several factors that increase the BMP and there are factors that decreases the BMP and it is a diagnostic test so it's very important to know uh, what increase and what decreases diagnostic test and what is its own um, uh, uh, what, what limits this test to helping us diagnose heart failure all righty we have a 53 year old patient stop 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 there Go to the question. Which one of the following is the best next step? Okay, chest CT scan, cardiac magnetic resonance, abdominal ultrasound, alpha fetoprotein. Hmm, I'm not sure which category is the question, but probably it's a two-step question. It could be cardiology, it could be gastroenterology. Okay, so I need to know the diagnosis. I need to find the diagnostic test. Let's go to the beginning. 53-year-old patient present to the office with worsening shortness of breath. Hmm. He reports worsening shortness of breath over the last four weeks. <clears throat> Initially, he was able to walk several blocks. However, currently he can only walk two blocks. He also reports waking up at night several times and feeling better upon sitting. The patient's past medical history is significant for diabetes, lipidemia, hemochromatosis, hypertension. His medications are perindopril, atropastatin, hydrochlorothiazide, insulin, metformin, sedapreptin. A review of systems the patient also reports increased weight gain over the last two months. Physical exam shows that the patient is looking tired 
Mean heart rate is 78, blood pressure is 120 over 80, oxygen saturation is 95 on room end. Respiratory rate is 18. Lung exam reveals bilateral crackles. Cardiovascular exam reveals an extra heart sound during early diastole with no murmurs, rubs, or gallows. Hmm. There is a plus 3 bilateral pitting edema on the lower extremities. Abdominal exam shows an increased X circumference. ECG shows in the next slide. And echo shows an increased pulmonary artery pressure and ejection fraction 65%. So first we have to know the diagnosis. Then we have to choose the chest. Let's look at the ECG first. Okay, this is the ECG. Let's go back to the question in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Choose an answer, stop the video, and then come back. And the correct answer is, drums please. Cardiac magnetic resonance is a commonly used diagnosis um, to diagnose myocarditis and infiltrative processes such as hemochromatosis, sarcoidosis, and amyloidosis. Hmm. Okay, so let's go back to the question a bit. Let's look at this question. So we have a 53-year-old patient. So if you are thinking about heart failure, this patient is pretty young to have a heart failure. So now we have to think about secondary causes. 53-year-old patient presents with worsening shortness of breath. Okay, so we have shortness of breath. She reports worsening shortness of breath over the last four weeks. So it's not acute. If it's acute, I'm going to think about PE. If it's acute, I'm going to think about COPD exacerbation. If it's acute, I'm going to think about asthma exacerbation. Initially was able to walk several blocks, however, he currently can only walk two blocks. So we have exertional shortness of breath. He reports waking up several times at night, feeling better upon sitting. So we have exertional shortness of breath and orthopnea. The patient's past medical history is for diabetes, dyslipidemia, hemochromatosis, and hypertension. Okay. His medications are <coughs> perendopril, adorbastatin, um, insulin, metformin, cetagliptin. Probably he has very advanced diabetes. So he's a vasculopath and hydrochlorothiazide. On review of the systems, the patient also reports increased weight gain over the last two months. So this patient might have heart failure related to coronary artery disease related to diabetes. He's pretty advanced in his diabetes. On physical exam, he looks tired. His heart is 78, the blood pressure is normal. His oxygen saturation is 95% on room air. You examine his lungs, there are bilateral crackles, so you have signs of volume overload. There is an also extra heart sound during early diastole, so that's an S3. There is an edema, again, so this is a sign of volume overload. So you have edema, sign of volume overload. We have bilateral crackles, sign of overload. Uh, we have extra heart sound, sign of volume overload. And the patient have, okay, so those are the main signs of volume overload, okay? And decrease shortness of breath, uh, oh, sorry, shortness of breath. Um, so the, all this is pointing toward heart failure, okay? But they added one thing, the ECG is shown in the next slide, and the echo shows increased pulmonary artery pressure and ejection fraction 65%. So this is a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Diabetes, when it leads to coronary artery disease, it leads to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So here we have a preserved ejection fraction. Let's go back to the echo. Okay, so if we look at this echo here, okay, um, so let's read it systematically. In the exam, you will not have the time to do this, but whenever, whenever I teach my students, like I always go through echo systematically. First, rate, rhythm, access. Okay, so let's look at the rate. Uh, so I try to count how many big squares are the blocks. Uh, it's not very obvious. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven-ish. So the heart rate is around 70, 70-something. 70 something. Okay. Rate, rhythm. Is it regular rhythm? It is regular. Axis. Okay, so lead one and AVF. So it's both positive or lead two and AVF, both positive. So it's, it's uh, generally speaking, it's normal axis. Okay. Then P waves. The PR interval, so the, 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 the P waves in general are looking normal, and then the PR intervals are short, normal, so there is no PR prolongation, and then the QRS complexes are narrow, but they are not only narrow, they are very small. We have low voltage, voltage QRS complexes. And let's look at the QT, we can't really calculate the QT completely, and let's look at the T. The T waves are flat, 
the T waves are flat. Okay. So going back to the question, okay, um, here if we look at the question, um, so this guy probably have hemochromatosis led to secondary diastolic dysfunction and we need a cardiac magnetic resonance uh, or uh, CMR to diagnose myocarditis and infiltrative diseases. Chest CT scan is usually used when you have peri chronic pericarditis um, where there is a calcification um, or sorry constrictive peri uh, pericarditis Re, uh, yes, constrictive pericarditis leads to calcification. You can see it on the chest CT scan. Abdominal ultrasound can be helpful in case of cirrhosis. Cirrhosis leads to abdominal distension, but cirrhosis does not explain the whole picture here. Alpha fitoprotein, it is ordered, uh, it's a test order to diagnose uh, hepatic cancer. It is, it is elevated in hepatic cancers, so it's not very helpful in this case because it's not an abdominal pathology, it's a cardiac pathology. Okay? Which one of the following is the most appropriate test? Chest CT scan, CMR, abdominal ultrasound, alpha protein, cardiac catheterization. Okay, so first I have to know the diagnosis, then I have to know which test to order. Let's start. We have a 73-year-old patient present to the office, not ED, office, with worsening shortness of breath. He reports worsening shortness of breath over the last four weeks. He initially was able to walk several blocks. However, currently he can only walk two blocks. He also reports waking up at night several times, feeling better upon sitting. The patient's past medical history is significant for diabetes, hypertension, and hemochromatosis. Um, his medications are perindopril, atrobastatin, hydrochlorothiazide, insulin, metformin, cetagliptin. Our view of the system, the patient is alert. Uh, he also reports increased weight gain over the last two months. You examine him, his heart rate is 78, the blood pressure is 120 over 80, Oxygen saturation is 95% and respiratory rate is 18. You examine his lung, that reveals bilateral crackles. Cardiovascular exam reveals an extra heart sound during early diastole with no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. There is a bilateral plus repeating edema on the lower extremities, decreased positional and vibration sensation. Abdominal exam, uh, ultrasound, oh, sorry, abdominal exam shows increased abdominal circumference. ECG is shown in the next slide. And echo shows an increased pulmonary artery pressure. The ejection fraction is 25% with anterior hypokinesis and normal LV wall thickness. So what should you do? Chest CT scan, cardiac magnetic resonance, abdominal ultrasound, alpha fitoprotein, cardiac catheterization. Let's look at the ECG quickly. All righty. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's go back to the question. Choose an answer. Hold the video, stop the video, think about it, and come back. And the answer is drums, please. Patients with a new onset heart failure who have a high risk of coronary artery disease should undergo cardiac catheterization. Let's go and look at this question. So we have a 73-year-old patient. So this is not a young patient. Okay? We're not going to go through the same symptoms of heart failure. We already know what are the signs and symptoms by now. Okay, but I want you to know that he has diabetes and he also have hemochromatosis and hypertension. He's on multiple medication for his diabetes. Okay, but the most important thing here, he has heart failure with reduced ejection fracture and anterior hypokinesis. Anterior hypokinesis, if there is a problem or if there is an atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis uh, in the left anterior descending artery, especially patients with diabetes, they might have heart attack without symptoms. So this patient might have a heart attack in the past. He didn't know about it. And that caused anterior hypokin hypokinesis. And the problem with the lesions in the LAD or the left anterior descending, he has low ejection fraction, normal left ventricular wall thickness, so in patients with hemo, uh, infiltrative diseases, usually they might have sometimes increased um, left ventricular wall thickness. So here we have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And the most common cause is di uh, a coronary artery disease, and that's why the patient is high risk and he needs a coronary uh, artery catheterization. Let's look at the ECG. Okay, let's le read this ECG systematically quickly. Rate, rhythm, and um, rate, rhythm, and access. Okay, so the rate, uh, it's not regular, so it's hard to calculate, but it's around normal rate. I'm not giving you the exact measurement because in the in the exam, you will not have the time to calculate the exact rate. So this patient is like, when uh, looking at it, he has irregular rate. Rhythm, sorry, 
uh, is it sinus or not sinus i can't see any p waves before the qrs so it's not sinus and the axis lead one avf or lead two avf positive positive uh, it's neutral so it's between normal to mildly left axis deviated because it's more positive in lead one okay the pr interval i can't look at it the qrs complexes are why they are not narrow and they are giving you that characteristic shape the uh, r r r pattern like or mr pattern or the rabbit ear pattern and the s uh, and the t waves are um, so there is a mild st segment elevation that is seen here which we're going to talk about and there is also like some the, uh, i i can't call this uh, t wave inversion okay so we have so let's summarize we have irregular rhythm so we have atrial fibrillation we have why the qrs complexes with rsr pattern uh, and left axis deviation this is in keeping with left bundle branch block so this patient probably you also have like st segment depression in v5 and v6 um, so this mild st elevation in v2 and v3 it's part of the left bundle branch block so this guy have left bundle this is an easy job left bundle branch block uh, so this guy have diabetes diabetes led to atherosclerosis atherosclerosis led to, led to um, coronary artery disease minor myocardial infarction that the patient did not feel and that led to presentation of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and the best test to do in this patient is higher risk for heart failure reduced ejection fraction is catheterization which one of the following is the best medication to add now dehydropyridine calcium channel blocker phospholysterase inhibitor cyclooxygenase inhibitor hormone receptor antagonist in the kidney endothelial receptor antagonist so this is a two-step question first i need to know the diagnosis then i need to the, know what is the treatment in this case um and also like uh, looking at the answer choices um so i think i'm around in the cardiovascular section cardiology or uh, peripheral arterial disease let's read the question quickly 63 year old patient present office for a follow-up after he was admitted for pneumonia two weeks ago the patient's past medical history is significant for heart failure dyslipidemia atrial fibrillation hypertension today he reports no symptoms he's feeling well his medications are perindopril metoprolol succinate atorvastatin rivaroxaban and lasix you examine him, his heart rate is 78, the blood pressure is 120 over 80, oxygen saturation is 98% on room air, his respiratory rate is 18. Long exam is normal. Cardiovascular exam reveals an extra heart sound during early diastole at the apex with no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. There is a bilateral plus one feeding edema on the lower extremities. Echo shows ejection fraction 39%, anterior hypokinesis, and normal left ventricular wall thickness mild mitral regurgitation mild pulmonary hypertension which one of the following is the best next step to add now okay hold stop choose an answer and then come back and the right answer is D okay we're going to explain later why the right answer is D. Okay, but let's look at the important things in the question. Okay, so we have a 63-year-old patient comes for a follow-up. He was admitted for pneumonia two weeks ago. So this guy is asymptomatic. So he's coming for a regular follow-up. Okay, so then I have to look at his past medical history and see which one I can optimize. This septemia, AFib, hypertension, heart failure. Okay. That's good. Today he reports no symptoms. He's on perindopril, metoprolol, atorvastatin, rivaroxaban, and Lasix. So he has a heart failure. Probably he's on uh, perindopril, metoprolol for his heart rate failure, uh, and atorvastatin probably also for his dyslipidemia. He has AFib. He's on rivaroxaban, and he's also on metoprolol for rate control for the AFib. Okay. So quickly looking at his vital signs, they are stable. There is nothing to add there. His physical exam is normal. He does have some degree of heart failure. They gave you an echo. They didn't give you a result of, uh, uh, they didn't give you the result of like another diagnostic test. So probably I'm thinking about heart conditions here, anterior hypokinesis, so heart failure for sure. Um, and ejection fraction 39%, heart failure for sure. Mild mitral regurgitation and mild pulmonary hypertension. 
So mild mitral re, uh, regurgitation, so this is something we see in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because the heart dilates, right? And the, the, if the heart dilates, so this will create mitral regurgitation uh, and pulmonary hypertension because the blood will back uh, will back up, the heart is not contracting properly, so the fluid will build up in the heart. Which one of the following is the best medication to add now? Okay, so the question is, I have a patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, review, of, review his medications and tell me which one I should add. Okay, so in this patient, his ejection fraction is 39%. So the next step would be among those choices, the right answer is, spironolactone which is a hormone receptor antagonist in the kidney okay we're going to talk about the steps of treatment let's move on to the next question okay which one of the following is the best next step to add on this patient okay i read the question uh, it's very similar question i need you to stop the video read the question and choose an answer and the right answer is D. Okay. So again, the explanation will follow. Let's look at the question. Important things here. Again, we have a patient who has heart failure with ejection fraction, with reduced ejection fraction. But now the patient is on perindopril, metoprolol, atorvastatin, rivaroxaban, Lasix, spironolactone. And based on the choices that we have here, the answer will be transport protein modulator in the kidney. We're going to talk about it in details in the next slide. Let's talk about treatment. Treatment in heart failure focuses on two things. One, I want my patient to live longer. Two, I want him to be symptom free, or let's say less symptoms. So for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, so these are the American guidelines, and then we're gonna to talk to about the Canadian guidelines. So whether you're preparing for Canada or the US, I got you. Okay, so the American guidelines, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, any patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, ejection fraction less than 40%, they should be on beta blockers, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, SGL2 inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor, um, sorry, uh, ARNI. So this is, as you can see, ARNI is used in stage two and three, NYHA class two and class three, ACE inhibitors, they are used in class two, three, and four. Okay, we're going to talk about each one of those treatment in more details, but I want you to memorize the flow. So any patient with heart failure, they should be on beta blockers, MRA, SGL2, ACE or RNA, ACE or RNA, beta blocker, MRA, SGL2, okay? So this treatment will reduce mortality. This treatment will make your patient live longer. ACE or ARVs, beta blocker, SGL2, these medications will help your patient to live longer. The diuretics help them to feel better. Live longer, ACE, beta, MRA, SGL2. Feel better, diuretics. Diuretics relieve the so, the, 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 uh, release the extra fluid that is being accumulated because of the heart failure. Okay, so if the patient persists, okay, we put them on their treatment, we repeat an echo after three months or two months, depending on the case, Usually after three months, the ejection fraction is still less than 40%. We might add other treatments, hydralazine and nitrate in African-American patients in class three and four NYHA. So they should be symptomatic. They should be symptomatic. As you can see, it is added in patients who have a shortness of breath class four. That means they are added in patients who, have, who are short of breath while they are sitting, doing nothing. Hydralazine and nitrate. If they are not African-American and their ejection fraction is less than 40%. I need to look at their ECG and based on their ECG and based on the ejection fraction, I might recommend either CRT or cardiac resynchronization therapy. We're going to talk about it or ICD. ICD is a shock device. CRT is a resynchronization device. We're going to talk about this more in details, but I want you to notice something that ICD is given for class one, two, three. CRTD is given for class two and three. 
They are not given in patients who are class 4. Class 4 NYHA, they are patients who are heavily short of breath. They are short of breath when they are sitting doing nothing. And those patients usually have terminal heart failure. They're usually at the end stage of their heart failure. Putting an ICD or a CRTD device is considered invasive and futile because it doesn't add a lot benefit to these patients. But notice that the CRT is added to patients who are ambulatory class 4. They can walk. They are still doing well. So those are invasive treatments. They are only reserved for patients who have really bad hearts. Ejection fraction less than 35% and ECG abnormalities. We're going to talk about it. First line treatment, decreased mortality, beta blocker, MRI, SGL2, ACE or ARNI. Relief symptoms, diuretics. Relief symptoms, diuretics. Repeat echo in three months. Ejection fraction still down 40%. Hydrolysis and nitrate if they were black. ICD or CRTD to help relieve the symptoms and to prevent mortality. We're going to talk about it. Of course, as the symptoms continue, there are other things. Referral to palliative care, cardiac transplant. These are beyond the USMLE Step 2, Step 3, and the Canadian exams. So you don't need to know them. Um, they are more at the level of the internal medicine, uh, American Board of Internal Medicine, or the Royal College exam. Okay. Let's look at the Canadian guidelines. As you can see, there, is, there isn't many, like, there isn't any difference, almost. So, ejection fraction is down 40%, and symptoms, heart failure, ACE, or ARNI, beta blockers, MRA, SGL2. So, as you can see, the first line treatment is a quadruple therapy, four medications, four, man, it's a lot. There is some difference on the next step. So, it's not, this is not reflected in the American guidelines, and I don't think you will be tested um, on the second line treatment other, beyond the beta blockers MRA. Very Siguat, it's not still approved in Canada. It's a new medication that reduces mortality in patients with heart failure who have recent heart failure hospitalization, and they are already on the first line treatment. Ifabradine, it decreases the heart rate. We will talk about it in the next slides. The heart rate is given, so if it decreases heart rate, you need a heart rate more than 70 to start these medications. Okay. Then, if the patient's symptoms persist, black patients on optimal guideline directed medical therapy, that means black patients who are already on ACE or ARNI, beta blocker, MRA, SGL2. Okay. Or patients who can tolerate ACE inhibitor, you can consider hydralazine isosurpid denitrate. And this is important. Once I had a patient who was a 60. Eight or 69 year old patient with advanced heart failure the patient was on MRA SGL2 but he did not tolerate beta blockers or ACE because he became very hypotensive so the cardiology team although he was not black considered putting them on hydralazine isosurpid denitrate because you can see the guideline says for patients who are unable to tolerate ACE ARBs or beta blockers because like those usually more ACE or ARBs because this medication causes hypotension. Okay, and if the symptoms persist, the ejection fraction is less than 35%. We can talk about ICD and CRTs. The sicker you get, the more invasive treatment you get. Okay, and then there are other treatments that you don't need to know for your step two, step three, and the MC uh, CQE1 exams. You can just read them for your knowledge. Okay. We're going to talk about the treatments in more details. Stay tuned. Which one of the following is the best next step? Arrange for pacemaker, hold and monitor for 72 hours, order an echo, cardiac MRI, review medications. We have a 65-year-old man brought to the emergency department after an episode of syncope during a family meeting. The patient was sitting in his chair after a dinner and passed out briefly. No seizure-like activity was observed. His granddaughter says that he has had frequent episodes of dizziness in the last two weeks after he was seen by his family doctor and started a new medication. However, she can't remember which medication was started on. These episodes are sometimes accompanied by confusion and are not related to physical activity or changes in the position. The patient's other medical problems include heart failure and hypertension. 
he does not use alcohol or tobacco. His medications include metoprolol, lisoprolol, atorvastatin, hydrochlorothiazide. His blood pressure is 105 over 60, and respiratory uh, respirations are 14 per minute. The patient is fully alert and oriented. The examination reveals no neck bruise, lung fields are clear, and no cardiac murmurs are heard. Neurological exam is within normal limits. ECG is shown in the next slide. Alrighty, let's look at the ECG quickly. So this is the ECG. Take a couple of moments, look at the ECG, stop the video, think about it. And the correct answer is... Alrighty, so let's go back to the question and like analyze the question a bit. Um, we have a 65 year old patient who was brought to the emergency department after an episode of syncope during a family meeting. Okay, so the question is telling if this is a syncope, it's not a seizure. The patient was sitting in his chair after dinner and passed out briefly. So when I have a patient who's presenting with syncope at rest, it's usually an arrhythmia. When I have a patient who's presenting with a syncope at exertion, it's usually aortic stenosis. No seizure-like activity was observed. His granddaughter says that he has had frequent episodes of dizziness in the last two weeks after he was seen by his family doctor that started communication. In the US MLEs or Canadian exams, always when there is a, like a medication that was started recently, when there is a, like something that was added recently, usually it is the cause. However, she can't remember which medication he was started on, and these episodes are sometimes accompanied by confusion and are not related to physical activity or change in position. Okay, so physical activity related syncope, think about aortic stenosis. Changes in position, think about orthostatic hypotension. They are telling you that this is not orthostatic hypotension, this is not aortic stenosis. The patient's other medical problems include heart failure and hypertension. He doesn't use tobacco, alcohol. His medications include metoprolol, succinate, lisinopril, atorvastatin, hydrochlorothiazide. Since he was a starter medication recently and he's having syncope, probably it's the metoprolol. We're going to talk about it more in details. Okay. Um, examination shows no neck bruise. This is important because syncope can be secondary to uh, stroke. It could be a TIA sometimes. So they are telling you that this guy's uh, carotids are clear. So in real life, uh, we usually think about TIA. Uh, we, ex we investigate secondary causes like TIA, but in the exam setting, when they tell you that there is there are no neck bruises, there, and it's another way to tell you that TIA is less likely. Lung fields are clear, no cardiac murmurs uh, are heard. Neurology exam is within normal limits. ACG is shown in the next slide. Which of the following is the best next step? Arrange for a pacemaker, hold or mortar for 72 hours, order an echo, cardio MRI, review medications. So review medications is the answer. Let's look at the ECG quickly and read the ECG. Rate treatment access, rate treatment access. So this was two weeks ago. This was today. Two weeks ago, it's normal rate, normal rhythm, normal access. Okay, so the rate is around 75. The access is lead one and AVF is normal. Rate, rhythm, rhythm at sinus, every QRS complex is preceded by a P wave. Here, as we can see, uh, the rate is less than a 60. Uh, and then we have a very prolonged um, uh, duration between, so, sorry, let's for, be systematic. So rate is slow, the access is normal. Um, the rhythm, I can't say it's sinus, not every QRS complex is preceded by a P wave. Okay, uh, then looking at the PR, okay, so we can see that there is like considerable prolongation between the PR, 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 PR. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. And there is a drop. Longer, longer, longer drop. Longer, longer, longer drop. Longer, longer, longer drop. Could be more with type 2. We're going to talk about it more in details in the arrhythmia section. Okay, the QRS complexes are still, uh, there is some widening QRS complexes, but looking at this ECG quickly, you know that there is some sort of block, and that's what will help you to solve this question. Okay, so now let's talk about beta blockers. Okay, so beta blockers, uh, I'll, the first time treating the patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Beta blockers improve remodeling, increase the ejection fraction because they make your heart relax. And if you can relax, you can work more. Okay, so the heart is relaxed. It takes more time to fill up with blood. Okay, so it has more blood to pump. 
right? So it increases ejection fraction, reduces hospitalizations and mortality, okay? So this is important. Beta blockers reduces mortality. Which beta blockers we use? Metocarbis, metoprolol, carvedilol, bisoprolol. Metoprolol, carvedilol, bisoprolol, bisoprolol, carvedilol, metoprolol, metocarbis. That's the mnemonic that I used to learn about to memorize heart failure medications. Okay, so looking at this, what are the side effects? Lightheadedness, very common. Hypotension, very common. And it's not only in the exam setting. This is something we see a lot in real life. On the medicine ward, we see lots of patients who come with lightheadedness, hypotension, and bradyarrhythmias, like second degree blocks, sometimes third degree blocks. Okay, you can give it in patients with cardiogenic shock. And this is something you see uh, if a patient is presenting with a critical cardiogenic shock, they will tell you in the question that this patient's extremities are really cold. Okay, his blood pressure is low. So, beta blocker is the wrong answer. Low blood pressure, cold extremities, beta blocker is the wrong answer. Okay, low blood pressure, cold extremities, beta blocker is the wrong answer. Okay, contraindication, second or third degree AV block. Okay, so you can start in a patient already have a block because it can lead to block. Okay, and evidence of pulmonary disease exacerbation. Okay, so pulmonary disease exacerbation, like a patient who already have a COP, if a patient is in COPD exacerbation and also having heart failure at the same time, don't give beta blockers. Okay, um, beta blockers should not be initiated if the patient has an acute bronchospasm or evidence of pulmonary disease exacerbation. All righty. Let's talk about ACE inhibitors. The most important thing about ACE inhibitors reduces morbidity and mortality. Mortality and morbidity. Okay, you are less sick and you are less likely to die with ACE inhibitors. Okay, so and it should be used uh, in patients with heart failure. Okay, whether they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. Okay, so the mechanism of action of ACE inhibitors, they block the conversion of androtensin C1 to androtensin 2 Okay, so they mainly work on the renin androtensin aldosterone system. The most important side effects are hypotension. They can lead to hypotension. It's important to not start them on a patient who's already hypotensive. Okay, they can lead to kidney dysfunction, and it's very important to monitor the patient's creatinine. Okay, um, even in real life, okay, so the, once you start ACE inhibitor, the creatinine increase, okay? Um, many physicians also don't recommend to start creat uh, don't start ACE inhibitor if the creatinine levels rises to 2.5 milligrams per deciliter or 221 micromoles per liter, okay? Or if the GFR is below 30, don't use them because they will make it just worse. Two important side effects that you're going to get tested on uh, most likely are the cough and the angioedema also. So the kidney dysfunction, they might give you a patient who is uh, a patient with a heart failure and for some reason they developed kidney dysfunction and they will ask you what medication to stop. Okay, so it's going to be ACE inhibitor or they might give you a patient who started on multiple medication and was a starter and ACE, one of them is ACE inhibitor and there will be a rise in the creatinine and they will ask you what to do. So if the rise is 30% or less, you can continue ACE inhibitor. If the rise is more than 30% or more than or the creatinine level is more than 2.5 milligram per deciliter or more than 221 micromoles per liter, stop it. Okay, that's too much. And then we're going to talk about the cough and angioedema in the next slide, okay? So it's very important to monitor the creatinine and the potassium when you give ACE inhibitor in patients with heart to, to patients with heart failure, right? Um, this is very, very important. It's even we do it in real life, usually in outpatient setting. When we start a patient on ACE inhibitor, we ask them to do... Uh, blood work uh, after a week or two weeks we monitor their creatinine we monitor their potassium and we make sure they are not developing worse than kidney function or elevated potassium okay um so let's talk a bit about other things that can beta blocker cause what if sorry ace inhibitor cause um what if the patient develops cough um so ace inhibitor induced cough is one of the reasons to switch to angiotensin receptor blocker okay um, so when they give you so the typical presentation you have a patient on the USML exams or Canadian exams presenting with a cough okay and they are on the ACE and they will ask you what to do next okay also 
what if the patient develops angioedema patient develop angioedema while taking ACE inhibitors okay are often switched to angiotensin receptor blockers okay but there are some cases when there is an interaction in real life patients who are developing angioedema due to ACE they might develop angioedema due for ARV this is rare for the exam purposes okay uh, usually you switch them to arms okay so those are two important side effects that we want to talk about refer to a cardiologist which, which of the following is the best next step at cetagliptine and empagliflozin refer to cardiology for crt refer to cardiology for pacemaker we have a 67 year old female patient come to the follow-up for a heart failure she has a history of ischemic cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of 35% and a 15-year history of diabetes and diabetic kidney disease. She's on rosuvastatin, sacubitril, balzartan, metaprol, succinate, metformin, aspirin. Her HbA1c is 6.5, creatinine level 1.5 and or 132.6 micromole per liter. Which one of the following is the best next step? Add citagliptin, add empagliflozin, refer to cardiology for CRT, refer to cardiology for pacemaker, and the correct answer is... B. SGL2 inhibitors are used for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because it decreases the cardiovascular debt whether they have diabetes or they don't have diabetes if we go back to our question and highlight the important things this patient's hba1c is 6.5 like this is amazing for a 67 year old with all this hba1c 6.5 this is a dream come true okay and she have like some degree of chronic kidney disease but it's not that bad okay so it's 1.5 again it could be worse i'm trying to be optimistic here her rejection fraction is 35 percent okay so what do we need for patients with heart failure we need beta blocker ACE inhibitors paranolactone or mra and sgl2 quadruple therapy first line quadruple therapy first line quadruple therapy four medication first line first line four medications four medications first line first medication four or first line four medications and this patient is lacking empagliflozin okay so um looking at this question so refer the cardiology for crt usually when they want you to refer someone to CRT, they will give you an ECG. You need a wide QRS complex on the ECG because CRT makes both ventricle contract simultaneously. We're going to talk about it. CRT is just like a marriage counselor and your right and left ventricles are the couples, but they are fighting. They are not contracting together. They are not in synchrony. So cardiac resynchronization therapy make the heart right and left be together refer the cardiology for a pacemaker pacemaker is used if your heart is slow okay so if you look at marathon runners okay and you look how they run they usually have a pacer the person who runs in front of them to guide them through their marathon if you know Elliot Kipchoge you can search him on YouTube you can see how he runs marathon there is a pacer so the pacer is the one who makes you go on a specific speed okay so this patient is not bradycardic there is no data about her bradycardia okay so pacemaker is a wrong answer um cetagliptin or saxagliptin are dipeptidyl pepidas 4 inhibitors this patient hpa1c 6.5 percent man why am i gonna put her on dipeptidyl pepidas inhibitor she's okay on metformin and it looks like she's doing okay also with lifestyle modification okay so the right answer here is adds empagliflozin we're going to talk about other treatments for heart failure okay so whenever there is a choice of lifestyle modification before medications like if there is like a choice of lifestyle modification um, usually this is implemented with the medications okay lifestyle modification alone it's not good but i have to mention it but by itself it's not enough like you have to add medications for patients with um, heart failure but just for uh, just for so you know um, the sodium restriction should be less than 1.5 gram a day and the fluid restriction should be less than 1.5 to 2 liters a day and this is something we do in the hospital as well okay so whenever i have a patient who is admitted for a heart failure exacerbation we make sure that the patient does not get lots of fluids and does not get lots of sodium okay so that being said let's talk about other medications okay so ivabrodine ivabrodine makes you go slower it's just like beta blockers man but it starts with an i ivabrodine 
Okay, so, but it does not affect the contractility. Okay, so I've already mainly work on the SA node, mainly work on the SA node, make you go slower. Mainly work on the SA node, makes you go slower. Take it easy. It does not affect the contractility. Go slower without affecting contractility. Go slower without affecting the contractility. It has no negative ionotropic effect. Indications are usually ejection fraction less than 35%. So this should be highlighted here. Okay? And the patient should be on the maximum dose of beta blocker. Usually they will not test you on that in the exam. So if the patient is on beta blocker and the rejection fraction is still less than 35% and they are having difficulty breathing, those are the indications of Vibradine and their heart rate should be more than 70 it's not mentioned here, but their heart rate should be more than 70. If they are slow, you put them on Ivabradine. Ivabradine will make them go slower. Ivabradine makes you go slow, okay? But you can't go slower than 60, okay? That's the speed limit, okay. Other medications. The Joxin, it reduces heart failure hospitalization, but does not reduce mortality. It does not, it will not make you live longer. It will not prevent or will not reduce mortality, okay? So if something does not reduce mortality and something else reduces mortality, which one I should use? The one that reduces mortality. If you have a heart failure, you want to live longer because heart failure itself decreases your life expectancy. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and AFib, the Joxin is the way to go. The Joxin reduces the risk of heart failure hospitalization but does not reduce mortality. Very important. Okay, it's best given for patients with AFib because it also controls the heart rate. Very important, very important, very important. But very important to know the joxin is associated with toxicity, okay? So acute toxicity can lead to um, gastrointestinal side effects. Chronic toxicity can lead to central nervous system. So this is very heavily tested on the USMLEs or the Canadian exams, okay? They will give you a patient with um, neuro symptoms or like confusion, okay, seeing hallows, seeing bloody vision, having some diarrhea, and the patient will have some heart failure, and he's on some multiple medications, and the joxin, one of them, boom, you should think about the joxin toxicity, okay, the joxin should be used carefully, because it's toxic, the joxin should be used carefully, because it's toxic, okay, and the older you are, the more likely you experience toxicity, and also it impairs kidney function, Okay, sorry, the toxicity higher in patients with kidney function, dysfunction. Okay, so if, you, if your kidneys are not working well, okay, you're more likely to develop the joxin toxicity. If your kidneys are not working well, you're more likely to, to develop the joxin toxicity. It does not reduce mortality. It's not the first line. Calcium channel blockers, okay? So usually the non dehydropyridine calcium channel blockers, verapamil and diltiazine, okay? Would you give them in heart failure? No, no. Calcium channel blocker, they will block calcium. Okay, if you don't have calcium, you can't contract. What is heart failure? It's a problem with the contractility. So if you have a problem with contractility and you make the patient further not contract, so this will make heart failure worse, okay? You can give amlodipine. Amlodipine works mainly on the vessels, okay? So it is helpful in patients with persistent hypertension, okay? But Verapamil, galopamil, don't give it because it will make your heart not contract. It affects the muscle, okay? We don't want that to happen. And now let's talk about implanted cardiac, cardioverter defibrillator and cardiac resynchronization therapy, okay? So let's talk quickly about them, okay? And then we're going to go more in details. What is an ICD, implantable cardioverter defibrillator? Let's say you have a heart failure and your heart failure is really really bad by bad i mean ejection fraction 35 percent or less ejection fraction 35 percent or less when you have that severe heart failure you're more likely to develop arrhythmias you're more likely to do, do vtap okay if you have two patients one of them with heart failure rejection fraction 40 and another is a heart failure rejection fraction 25 the one with the ejection fraction 25 is more likely to develop arrhythmias. One of those arrhythmias are ventricular tachycardia, okay? And ventricular tachycardia is a lethal arrhythmia, okay? So if you have a cardiac arrest, 
If you have a cardiac arrest on the street, someone will jump on your chest and will do chest compression. Is that correct? Yes. What if I can minimize that someone and put them into a device and put that device in your chest? So whenever you have an arrhythmia, whenever you have beta, boom, I can shock you, bring you back to life. Whenever you have arrhythmias, I can shock you, bring you back to life. Okay, so that's the cardioverter defibrillator. It's a person who can do CPR implanted in your heart. It's a person who can do CPR implanted in your heart. Okay, so that's why it's given in patients with class two or class three symptoms. Because patients who have NYHA class four, they are short of breath. When they are sitting doing nothing, those patients have really advanced heart failure. When you have a patient with that advanced heart failure, you start thinking about palliative treatment. Prolonging life will only prolong suffering. But the patient with the NYHA class two or class three, okay, putting a shocking device, that means preventing VTAC, that means preventing death, that means prolonging life, it's a good thing, okay? So, um, ICD is recommended in patients with ejection fraction, 35 or less, and NYHA class two and class three symptoms, okay? On the other hand, on the other hand, Let's talk about cardiac resynchronization therapy. Cardiac resynchronization therapy, okay? Again, when you have heart failure, you are not only prone to develop arrhythmias, your right heart and left heart are not contracting together. They are not in synchrony. They are not in love, okay? So what we can do is we can bring them back to synchrony. We can bring them back to love. So your cardiac resynchronization therapy is a psychologist, is a marriage counselor who comes and sits between the heart and the left, between the right and the left heart, and tell them to contract together. And that's why one of the indications of cardiac resynchronization therapy is you need to have a why the QRS complex. Why the QRS complex is seen when your right and your left ventricles don't contract together. It reduces this synchrony. Okay, so it is given in patients with prolonged QRS or prolonged left, bond, or they have like left bundle branch block on their ECG. Okay, um, and we're going to talk more about it in details. Which one of the following is the best next step? Refer to CRT, refer to ICD, refer to pacemaker replacement, follow up in duration in three months. Stop metaprobe. Okay, we have a 73 year old. Before going to the question, okay, just reading the main question and the examples. I know I'm, I'm, I'm in the cardiovascular section and I know that probably they are asking me for treatments. Okay, so I have to know the diagnosis, I have to know what the patient is on, on and then I have to choose a diagnosis or treatment. Okay, so we have a 73 year old patient present to the emergency department with worsening chest pain for one day. The pain started two hours ago and he described it as retrosternal. Whoa, that sounds like an acute man. Sharp red eating to his jaw. Initial ECG showed an S segment elevation lead 23 AVF. We have an MI. The patient is diagnosed with heart failure and is admitted to the hospital. He was transferred to the cath lab and 90% stenosis was found in his right coronary artery. A stent was placed and the patient was started on dual antiplatelet therapy. After two weeks, okay? After two weeks, he comes back for a follow-up appointment. You review his medications. You notice he's on metoprolol, dapagliflozin, perindopril, atorvastatin, aspirin, anticagrelor. You examine him. His heart rate is 78. Blood pressure is 130 over 80. Oxygen saturation is 98%. Respiratory rate is 18. Lung exam reveals a clear lungs. Amazing. Cardiovascular exam reveals an extra heart sound during early diastole with systolic murmur heard at the apex. No rubs. There is a bilateral plus one edema on the lower extremities. An echo shows normal biatrial size and function. Ejection fraction is 30% and inferior wall motion abnormality. What would you do? How you would treat? Start the video, think about it, choose an answer, then come back. And the answer is... D. Okay, so follow up with the patient in three months. Ejection fraction and symptoms should be reassessed after guideline-directed medical therapy 
40 days after the myocardial infarction. So you have to assess the ejection fraction 40 days after myocardial infarction and three months in all other causes. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, what does that mean? What's going on? I, didn't, I really don't understand the question. Okay, so let's look at the question. So this guy is coming with a chest pain. Okay, he has an SSC med elevation lead to 3 AVF. Let's do some teaching here. Okay, we have SSC med elevation to 3 AVF. Okay, so that's a territory of the right coronary artery and that's what they found they took him to the cat lab they found that does, he does have a problem in his right coronary artery okay and that's what the echo shows in after two weeks when he, he came to the clinic they did an echo the guy was having inferior wall motion abnormality so it's all in keeping in the same area that makes sense they fixed his artery okay so any patient with coronary artery disease uh, develops an mi they should be based on the guidelines they should be on dual antiplatelet therapy so this guy is coming to the clinic. He's on aspirin and ticagrelor. And because the most common cause of heart failure is coronary artery disease. And this patient does have coronary artery disease. So he should also be on the treatment for heart failure. And probably he will, uh, he does have some degree of heart failure. So he's, they started him on dapagliflozin, SGL2, perindopril, atorvastatin, and metoprolol. So he's on beta blocker, he's on SGL2, he's on ACE. What's missing here? Okay. Asin, um, uh, angio, uh, aldosterone receptor, uh, spironolactone. Okay, so spironolactone is missing here. But anyways, that's not the question. Okay, so this guy is on dual antiplatelet for his coronary artery disease. He's on ACE inhibitors. He's on SGL2 inhibitors. He's on beta blockers for his heart failure. Comes to the clinic. The problem is this. Before going to the problem, let's look at the, the systolic murmur. So this is a murmur heard due to mitral regurgitation. The patient is having secondary mitral regurgitation when you have heart failure okay so this will lead dilation of the mitral annulus so this will lead to mitral regurgitation so um, and then something else here this guy is having extra heart sound during early diastole so this guy is having estrus so, so he does have heart failure okay he does have heart failure we know that although they didn't tell us about his echo back in the hospital which is not important here but after two weeks after two weeks, so we fix his coronary artery. After two weeks, his ejection fraction is 30%. And they are asking you, would you put him, uh, would you put an ICD? Usually the indication of putting an ICD is ejection fraction less than 35% and the patient should be on optimal medical therapy. Okay, we can't optimize his medical therapy. There is no option to add spironolactone here, right? So probably that's not an answer. Refer to CRT. We don't have an ECG. We don't have white QRS complexes. Okay, so we can't choose CRT. Okay. Refer for pacemaker, we don't have cardiac block, we don't have AV block, we don't have symptomatic secondary heart block, we don't have third degree heart block, we don't have a block, so pacemaker is not an answer. Stop metaprolol, we don't have side effects, why are we are going to stop it? Okay, as we said, metaprolol, carbidolol, bisaprolol, metacarbis is okay in heart failure. Follow up with the patient in three months is the answer, okay? So patients, once they develop heart attack, they will develop heart failure, but you need to assess their ejection fraction after 40 days to decide if you need to optimize their treatment or not. Okay? Ejection fraction, because this can improve, but usually it takes 40 days after myocardial infarction and three after three months or after other events. Like if the patient did not have a myocardial infarction, but he had like, let's say, carriage, okay? Um, so his myocardial, uh, sorry, his ejection fraction will improve after three months. Okay, so that's the teaching point of this question. Which one of the following is the most likely cause of his symptoms? Addition of cyclooxygenase enzyme, activating antithrombin, inhibition of co-transporter in the kidney and resulting in electrolyte imbalance, inhibition of acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular junction, increased calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So first, this is a question that I need to know the diagnosis and then I need to know the treatment and then I need to know mechanism of action or the side effect of the treatment let's start treating the question 73 year old patient presented the ed after worsening shortness of breath for one day on baseline he was able to walk several blocks however he currently can hardly walk without gasping for air he also reports waking up at night several times and feeling better upon sitting the patient's past medical history is significant for diabetes dyslipidemia and hypertension his medications are perindopril atorvastatin hydrochlorothiazide insulin metformin and sedacliptin on review of his systems, the patient also reports increased weight gain over the last two months. He also reports a runny nose and cough for two weeks. Uh, af uh, two weeks ago, after he came from Australia, and he treated it by increasing his fluid intake. We examined him, the patient's, the 
patient looks tired, his heart rate is 78, the blood pressure is 160 over 80, oxygen saturation is 95%, a room air, respiratory is 18, lung exam reveals bilateral crackles, cardiovascular exam reveals an extra heart sound during early diastole, with systolic murmur heard at the apex, no rubs or gallops, there is a bilateral plus trepidating edema on the lower extremities, echo shows normal by atrial exercise and function, Increased pulmonary artery pressure, ejection fraction 65%, chest x ray shows bilateral interstitial about peripronchial coughing, increased cardiothoracic ratio. The patient was a start on appropriate therapy. The second day after admission, he reports feeling generalized muscle weakness. Which one of the following is the most likely cause of his symptoms? Okay, are you ready? So the most likely cause is C. Um, loop diuretics are used in treatment of heart failure and can cause hypokalemia and can lead to weakness. Okay, so let's, so let's go and look at the question. So we have a 73-year-old patient who presents to ED with shortness of breath, and this is for one day. This is happening for one day. So this is an acute. When I have acute shortness of breath, I think about pulmonary embolism. I think about heart failure exacerbation. I think about COPD exacerbation. So, looking here, the, this has started acutely, and now, like, there is a deterioration from his baseline. He, they are also telling you that he wakes up at night several times and feels better upon sitting. So, he does have orthopnea. The patient's past medical history, diabetes, acidity, hypertension. So, the patient has orthopnea, and he's also a vascular path, so he has, like, vascular pathologies. His medications are perindopril, statin, hydrochlorothiazide, insulin, metformin, sedaviliptin. So, he's on some medications for hypertension so he's on some medication for diabetes he also tells you that he's been gaining weight over the last two months it looks like that this patient developed heart failure and his symptoms are, has been getting worse he traveled recently and he had some cold and he increased the fluid intake so that cold and increasing fluid intake probably tripped tipped him and made the heart failure worse you examine him he's a bit hypertensive he has bilateral crackles so this is a sign of volume overload uh, there is an extra heart sound, so this is the S3, and there is systolic murmur heard at the apex, so this is a secondary mitral regurgitation due to annual dilation in context of heart failure. He does have plus 3 edema. So this guy have like also signs of volume overload, and that is evident on the chest x-ray. So this is an acute exacerbation of heart failure. So here the goal is to relieve the symptoms, okay? Their goal is not to prevent, like, uh, to think about the long run, like, preventing mortality with beta blockers or ACE inhibitors, like, this should be done, but first you have to relieve the symptoms. Okay, so to relieve the symptoms, okay, so you need to relieve the symptoms of volume overload, and how do you treat volume overload? You mainly give Lasix, that's it. Uh, so when you give Lasix, Lasix works on the kidneys and inhibit a co-transporter, so inhibit the sodium potassium chloride channel, and this can lead to hypokalemia. One of the symptoms of hypokalemia is generalized muscle weakness. So that's why inhibition of co-transport in the kidney is the right answer. Inhibition of cyclooxygenase inhibitor is less likely to be the right answer because cyclooxygenase is inhibited by the non-steroidals, and those medications are usually used for pain, and they can exacerbate heart failure. Activating antithrombin, this is the mechanism of heparin, and the patient did not develop pulmonary embolism, and he was not start on heparin. And activation, uh, activating antithrombin does not explain the generalized muscle weakness. Inhibition of acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular junction, this is not the mechanism of Lasix. It is caused by other medications, which we're going to review in following courses. Increased calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is the, again, not the side effect of Lasix. Increased calcium release from sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is a mechanism of digoxin. Digoxin increases contractility by increasing the sarco by increasing calcium release. So you have more calcium, and then that will lead to higher contractility of the muscle and increased ejection fraction. Which one of the following carries a poor prognostic factor? Recent ICD shocks, age, creatinine level, BMI, multiple comorbidities. So I have to know the diagnosis, and then I have to know the risk factor okay so a 75 year old patient evaluated in the clinic after a discharge where he was admitted for short time for multiple icd shocks he has a crt icd device his past medical history is dyslipidemia diabetes atrial fibrillation 
Hypertension is medication improvement after all perineal problem metformin, semiglutide, insulin, apixaban. On exam, he looks in no acute distress. Blood pressure is 128 over 73, heart rate 65. Respiratory rate 15, temp is 36.7, O2 is 97%. The BMI is 32, lung exam is normal, cardiovascular exam is normal, JVP is 4 cm above sternal angle. There is a plus 3 peating edema on the lower extremities. Blood work shows sodium 133. Potassium 3.9, chloride 98, and creatine 1.1. What does carry a poor prognostic factor? Recent ICD shocks, age creatinine, BMI, multiple comorbidities. And stop the video, think about it. And the right answer is. Hey, okay, so let's look at the question and then let's talk about the teaching point in this question. Um, so this guy have a heart failure, okay, or advanced coronary artery disease, and he's also he also does have CRT and ICD. He's on multiple medications, so that means he's on advanced heart failure. He also have like BMI, high BMI. His blood work is okay, he's not that concerning. And the recent ICD shock is associated with poor prognosis. Age is not that prognostic factor. We're going to talk about prognostic factors in heart failure. Creatine level, creatine is not high. Multiple comorbidities. He does have multiple comorbidities, but they are not as they are not as prognostic as recent ICD shocks. And uh, he does have high BMI, but having an ICD shock that means your heart is going into ventricular tachycardia, and the shock device or the ICD is stopping that. So that's a very poor prognostic factor okay so remember uh, in general hospitalization this guy was hospitalized poor exercise tolerance ICD filing hyponatremia worsening kidney function cachexia increased need of loop diuretics are all these are poor prognostic factors okay looking at prognostic factors heart failure hospitalization so if, 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 if they ask you in the exam like uh, about heart failure hospitalization, the hospitalization carries high risk or poor prognosis. Poor exercise tolerance, if the patient can't walk, okay, they have NOHA class 4. ICD filing, like our patient, hyponatremia, our patient's sodium level was normal. Worsening kidney function, that means the patient is developing cardiorenal syndrome. Cardiac cachexia, they are very thin. Needing high doses of diuretic to maintain new volumia. You see patients with heart failure on like 100 milligram Lasix, 200 milligram Lasix. Symptomatic hyponation that requires stopping medication. Lots of patients with heart failure, they might be hypotensive, and that might require stopping their beta blockers or ACE inhibitor, and this is considered a poor prognostic factor. Alrighty, so which one of the following will help prevent another hospital admission? Yearly physical exam, follow up visit with the family doctor in a week, repeat echo in two months, monitor BMP levels, okay? so. First, I have to know the diagnosis, and then I have to know what will prevent them from getting into the hospital again. So it's a more prognosis-related question. I have a 75-year-old patient is evaluated in the clinic following a discharge uh, for after a short admission for heart failure exacerbation. He has a CRT ICD. His past medical history is significant for dyslipidemia, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, and hypertension. His medications include metoprolol, perindopril, metformin, semiglutide, insulin, and apixaban. We examine him. He looks in no acute distress. Blood pressure is normal. Heart rate is 65. Respirator is 15. Temperature is 36.7. O2 97%. The BMI is 32. Lung exam is normal. Cardiovascular exam is normal. Jugular venous pressure is 4 cm above the sternal angle. There is a plus 1 edema on the lower extremities. Which one of the following will prevent another hospital admission? So this is a straightforward question. Um, so they are giving a patient with heart failure and they are asking you what will prevent this from happening again but also this is not a regular heart failure this guy was discharged recently okay think about it and pause the video choose an answer and the right answer is A follow-up with the family doctor is recommended to prevent 
patient's early readmission to the hospital. So patients with heart failure, when they get admitted to the hospital, we treat their hypervolemia with diuretics. We manage that with Lasix. And when you give Lasix, it can lead to electrolyte imbalances, and you give Lasix intravenously, and then you switch them to PO. The problem is when you switch them from intravenously to PO, sometimes you might give some extra dose, sometimes you might give like less than the required dose, so you need someone to follow up on that. And that's the idea of this question. The idea of this question is, or the learning point is, 25% of patients are readmitted with heart failure within 30 days of the index hospitalization. So our patient who was recently discharged, they have high risk of being readmitted again. Within 30 days, like this is like one out of four patients with heart failure where they will get readmitted again. Two key elements are associated with successful transition from hospital to home. One is a follow-up phone call within two to three days of discharge. So someone calls them and asks them about their symptoms. Two, an office visit within seven to 14 days of hospital discharge. The idea here is when they are being seen by a family physician, uh, the family physician see them measure their jugular venous pressure, look at the edema at the lower extremities and listen to their lungs so they can assess their volume status and also look at their blood work if there are any electrolyte imbalances and based on that they can decide what is the optimum dose of their medication and if there is any medication they can optimize and also on top of that they can do education they can review the adherence with the patient they make sure that the patient are taking their medication as prescribed as you saw earlier in the slides heart failure medications are a lot like <laughs> The first line is four medications, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, spironolactone, uh, MRA, ARNI, A, like uh, SGL2 inhibitors, right? So we start them on, and then on top of that, you give them Lasix as needed or based on their volume status uh, to relieve the volume congestion. So there are lots of medications and you have to make sure that they are adherent to their medications. Um, so this is very important thing uh, to consider in patients with heart failure after discharge. So you call them in two days and you do an office visit within seven to 14 days after discharge. Which of the following should be the patient evaluated for? A 75 year old female evaluated in the clinic for a follow-up appointment. Her past medical history is significant for heart failure, dyslipidemia, diabetes, AFib, hypertension. Her medications include metoprolol, perindopril, metformin, semiglutide, insulin, and apixaban. We examine her, she's not in acute distress. Her heart rate 65, respiratory rate 15, temperature is 36, oxygen saturation 97%, the BMI is 32, lung exam is normal, cardiovascular exam is normal, JVP is 4 centimeters, a plus 1 edema on the lower extremities. So what would you evaluate her for? Thrombocytopenia, anemia, generalized anxiety disorder, second degree AV block. Okay, think about it. And the right answer is... Anemia. Okay. The teaching point of this question is all patients should be evaluated at the baseline for anemia, which is independently associated with heart failure severity. Let's look at the question again, okay, in new eyes. So this patient is coming for follow-up appointment. The patient is completely asymptomatic. They have heart failure, dyslipidemia, diabetes, AFib, and hypertension. Her medications include metoprolol, perindopril, metformin. So they have one, two, three conditions. Okay, so these conditions are what matters and their vital signs are normal. So thrombocytopenia, we don't usually evaluate patients with uh, AFib and on apixaban for thrombocytopenia. This is not something common and also we don't evaluate them for anemia. Okay, generalized anxiety disorder. Patients with heart failure, they might have anxiety, they might have depression, but it's not, the guidelines doesn't mention that we should evaluate them for this. Second degree AV block, the patient is on metformin, but again, the guidelines don't state that the patient should be evaluated for uh, second degree AV block or third degree AV block if they are on beta blockers. So this is a pure knowledge question, okay? The idea here is uh, patients who have heart failure, so it's, it's a fact you have to know, uh, patient who have high failure, they have also iron deficiency, and iron deficiency has been linked with reduced functional capacity in patient with heart failure. Anemia by itself is independently associated with heart failure severity. All patients with heart failure should be evaluated at baseline for anemia. Anemia is independently associated for heart failure severity. 
Also, iron deficiency has been linked with reduced functional capacity. If you have heart failure and you are also iron deficient, you are not going to be able to do everyday activities like dressing, eating, ambulating, toileting, hygiene. Okay? There are some studies that looked into this. Um, also, I think that there, that there are some suggestions that patients with heart failure, they can have like congestion in their bowel, and this can impair the absorption of um, iron treatment. So if they have iron deficiency, this can impair the absorption of iron treatment. Uh, and so th there is a potential impaired intestinal absorption. So patient with heart failure, the guidelines suggest to use IV iron therapy when they have iron deficiency. Okay, remember patients with heart failure, one of the symptoms is decreased appetite. Why? Because like the bowels are all distended with a lot of, lots of fluids that are uh, in the inferior vena cava and the portal vein and they are blocked. They, they, they can't move because the heart is failing. The heart is not pumping enough blood. So the bowels are congested. Giving them PO iron is not that helpful. So usually the guidelines recommend to treat patients who have iron deficiency and heart failure with IV iron. Okay. Which one of the following will prevent this patient's condition from deterioration? Blood pressure control, low salt diet, weight loss, decreased alcohol intake. We have a 72-year-old woman with long-standing hypertension, obesity, type 2 diabetes. She comes for shortness of breath, which increased over the last several months. So this is a chronic. She currently uses three pillows to sleep overnight. She reports drinking one glass of night of wine every day with dinner. Current medications include metoprolol and lodipine hydrochlorothiazide and low dose daily Lasix. On exam, blood pressure is 156, heart rate 65, respiratory rate 17, oxygen saturation is 96%, the BMI is 27. Long exam shows mild inspiratory crackles on the basis. Cardiovascular exam shows an extra heart sound at late diastole. JVP is at 7 cm over the stellar angle. Lower extremity exam shows bilateral plus edema. Chest X-ray is clear, blood work is normal, echo order shows ejection fraction 72%, mild mitral regurgitation without regional wall motion abnormalities. Which one of the following will prevent the patient's condition from deterioration? Pause the video, think about it. And the right answer is... A. Blood pressure control. Primary therapy for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction are diuretics and antihypertensive to maintain their systolic blood pressure less than 130. Our patient had heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and by now you will uh, know this by if we go back to the question. Okay, so we have the signs of heart failure that we talked about uh, throughout the course, but ejection fraction is 72%, so the heart failure diagnosis is clinical. and. The question is, what will prevent heart failure with preserved ejection fraction from deterioration? When it comes to the treatment of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, diuretics are used to control symptoms of volume overload. Antihypertensive agents are used to target systolic blood pressure less than 130. And we also use sodium glucose co-transported SGL2-2 inhibitors. Remember that the primary therapies for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction are diuretics to control volume overload and antihypertensive. SGL2 inhibitors should be considered in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction to reduce risk of dying from cardiovascular causes or hospitalization regardless if they have diabetes or not. I repeat, SGL2 inhibitors they should be considered or given in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction because they reduce the combined risk of cardiovascular death or hospitalization, whether the patient have diabetes or not. This was the last slide of the cardiology of the heart failure section. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any comments, please feel free to email me at rou.od as in Delta A as in Alpha B as in Bob. R-O-U-O-D-A-B at gmail.com.